Welcome to Only For Your Ears and today's episode. But first, I'd like to give a big thanks to people that have liked, shared and subscribed to this channel. This is very much appreciated. Now for episode 47, Valdemar Day and His Daughters by Hans Christian Andersen, which I've renamed as Greed is Never Satisfied. We'll start off with the usual structure with a summary where I'll digress on a few highlighted sentences and give a brief reflection. Then we'll move on to my critical review where I'll give a parallel to the fairy tale using a recent film. And last but not least, we'll look at the trigger points, what triggered me in this fairy tale. And to close, we'll end with my quote. Now, Valdemar Day and his daughters, or Greed is Never Satisfied, is a fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen that follows the life of Valdemar Day, a nobleman who becomes consumed by the quest for wealth and power through the Philosopher's Stone. I digress. This is a clear example of how prestige and possessions doesn't fill the emptiness his soul is carrying around him. Obsession leads to neglect of his family and the eventual downfall of their once prosperous life. I digress. He threw away a most treasured life that he couldn't appreciate with an obsession and a soul's purpose that wasn't his to complete. Reflection. The importance of family. The story highlights the significance of family and the bonds that hold it together. Valdemir's obsession with the quest drives a wedge between him and his daughters and ultimately causing their relationship to deteriorate. This tale teaches us that family should be a priority over material wealth and power. Valdemar, who lives in a castle with his daughters, Ida Joanna and Anna Doritha, become fixated on finding the philosopher's stone that he believes is hidden deep in his castle. I digress here, people. This man desperately wanted a sense of purpose for his life, so he created a treasure hunt in his castle out of sheer boredom. As this pursuit intensifies, he squanders his fortune and the castle falls into disrepair. His daughters, once happy and carefree, are now burdened with sadness and hardship. I digress. The king's greed, selfishness, and complete disregard for his family is telling. Ungratefulness feeds scarcity. Reflection. The futility of the quest for perfection. Valdemir's search for the philosopher's stone, a symbol of perfection and ultimate knowledge, reflects the human desire for absolute control and mastery over one's destiny. The story suggests that such a quest is ultimately futile and can lead to disastrous consequences. With their family, in ruins, the daughters try to support themselves and their father. Ida becomes a tutor, Joanna a seamstress, and Anna Doritha resorts to begging on the street. Despite their efforts, their lives remain filled and with struggle and sorrow. I digress. Well, this is what you unfortunate this is what unfortunately happens when the head of the household is rendered useless. Reflection, the beauty of simplicity. The story contrasts the simple joys and comforts of life with the destructive pursuit of wealth and power. As Valdemir's daughters find ways to support themselves and their father, they learn to appreciate the value of hard work, resilience, and the small pleasures in life. The wind reflects the wind reflects the, as serving as a narrator. I digress, graces us with the fluctuating tides that sweep across the skies of their life. The wind serves 
as a tragic tale of Valdemir Day and his daughters. Uncheckered ambitious ambition, greed, and the pursuit of power at the expense of love and family. Reflection, the impermanence of wealth and power. Valdemar downfall also serves as a reminder of the fleeting nature of wealth and power. No matter how much we accumulate, these things can be lost in an instant and true happiness often lies in the relationship we build and the love we share with others. I digress, I'm afraid money can't buy love or happiness or a purpose. Now for my critical review on how this fairy tale plays in today's society. This is an intriguing fairy tale about human nature that's beautifully narrated by the wind to illustrate the sense of forceful intentions with a lack of direction leading to no purpose. The winds create the cruelty and withering punishment to mirror the stupidity of one's actions. The nobleman who has everything tries to find real value in his life by chasing after the philosopher's stones, which he's convinced is hidden deep in his extravagant castle. His obsession reveals an ungrateful soul that breeds scarcity of resources and destroys his family. His lack of appreciation leads him to squander a most envied lifestyle. It just goes to show with an empty heart, there is no life or no real purpose. This reminds me of the disasters that the disaster that took place when five people died abroad, ocean gates, unregulated titan submersible last summer. The company's CEO, Stockton Rush, ocean explorer, Paul Henry Wogolot, aviation mogul Hamish Hardin, who claimed to have be a billionaire and one of the richest men in the world, wasn't even on Forbes magazine, and a Pakistani businessman. These men had more than enough money to live life to the full, but were dissatisfied and took it upon themselves to invest billions of dollars to discover even more riches trapped in the Titanic. They tried to find a purposeful mission that really wasn't their calling. This simply is the nobleman's predicament in the fairy tale. Now we're gonna take a look at the film that I think is very close in parallel, and that is There Will Be Blood. I'm gonna use a digress to in introduce the story. I digress, this just goes to show the prestige and doesn't feel the emptiness the soul needs. Obsession leads to the neglect of his family and the eventual downfall of their once prosperous life. The film follows the rise to power of Daniel Plainview, a charismatic, ruthless, oil prospector driven to succeed by his intense hatred of others and desperate need to see any of all <clears throat> competitors fail. When he learns of oil rich land in California that can be bought cheaply, he moves his operation and his young son there and tries to manipulate, and he does manipulate the local people there to give up their land. And so, and he buys it from them very, very cheaply with the promise in exchange that he's going to build schools, he's going to be universities, he's going to build shops and all different businesses to build up the neighborhood, which is a total fallacy to be quite honest. Then he begins to and the more power he accumulates, he begins to alienate himself from society and not even his son can convince the locals that he actually has blood running through his veins. He accumulates all this power, he, he has all this hate inside of him 
all this manipulation and is ruthless and has a son that doesn't serve much of a purpose for him anymore. And he becomes an alcoholic because he's, he's miserable. Money and power cannot bring you happiness in its entirety. Love is what really fills us up. And then, and the love that we feel inside of ourselves is the wealth that can bring about all types of blessings and abundance. And I think this man finally realizes it at the end of the film that he spent his whole life empty and trying to fill himself up with money, prestige, power, and a purpose. It wasn't a very good purpose, but that's just my opinion. And he realizes that he's just in, in, in total heartache, which is really sad. But again, it reflects back to the nobleman, Valdemar Dyer. Then we'll move on now to the trigger points. The trigger points, what triggered me? Well, there are a couple of things that triggered me and I'll show you a couple of them. Number one, the noble man being head of the, this affluent household, he lost total control over the reins of authority and his obsession, hence the need for a new purpose. The man is supposed to be the strong one, but in the fairy tale, written very beautifully by Hans Christian Andersen, the reality is, is that his three children who pull together their resources and manage the castle and learn to live life through simplistic means, have be very resilient and very resourceful. They live a good life, but it's full of struggles, but they learn how to manage with their father that's totally useless. And let me just say this, you know, men have for decades been given this mantle of they're so strong and they are physically, physically stronger than women. This is definite people. They are physically stronger than women. But they do not have the emotional intelligence or the psychological resilience or in some cases, I think, the spiritual strength to maintain and sustain a life in, in all its entirety. But they do have the and, and, and rational and the analytical side to them as well. I think you need all. I think in today's society, you definitely need all aspects. Michelle Obama is another one that came to mind. In 2016, when Michael Moore, a very uh, political filmmaker and very, well, what you'd say very left wing, begged Michelle Obama to run for president. He really wanted her and all of the pol political talking heads wanted her to run too. But she made it very clear. She goes, no, I'm, I'm not going to run. You know, Hillary Clinton is the one that wanted to run and to be president, to be the first female president. And that's what was going to happen. Um, she frankly told the media running for president wasn't her purpose. She knew that she could be far more effective staying in her own lane. Hillary Clinton didn't have the same wisdom. Although Hillary made an excellent secretary of state, she would have been a terrible president. On top of that, the country didn't like her. They saw her as deeply polarizing. You can clearly see America's reaction to Madam Vice President Kamala Harris is very different from Hillary Clinton's. And I personally believe that she has more than a, a passing shot to win the presidency. Now my trigger, I'm a strong empath and I was a great resource for my narcissistic mother and a supplier. That's what I was, I was a narcissistic supplier. I continued to be used and abused through most of my life 
until my mother died and I was hit with many problems. I had many tower moments leading up to my 14 month stay in Vancouver. My counselor told me that all, although I didn't like people, I had the engine of care. I never wanted to work in the profession of the care profession. I had been doing that since childhood. So why would I want to do it again? This is not what I wanted. But it seemed as though universe and spirit gave me a certain talent in the area of counseling, being a life coach, being a support, maternal, all of those qualities. And so I, I've ended up becoming, or I will be becoming a certified life coach and start my own business. Starting my own business was nothing that I, I, I didn't want to do that either, but I have ended up realizing that it would be the best thing for my life. I'm also going back to using my artistic and creative talents, which I never thought I would can, you know, use ever again. I stopped dancing more than 25 years ago and I wasn't going to use any of the creative skills, but it's like universe and spirit have created a way for me to use all of what the qualities and the gifts and the talents that I have. So I found my purpose alongside with using a gift that I didn't necessarily want to use or recognize. I found my purpose using that gift and also breathing life back into my creative talents. So that was the trigger points. And this is the end of today's episode. And I'd just like to close with my quote. Healing is a lifelong blessing, lesson and gift we give ourselves, mind, body, and soul. Healing is a lifelong lesson, blessing, and gift we give ourselves, mind, body, and soul. Goodbye until next time.